We'll keep we're in the last session of the day. We're nearly there, so it's a long old day. And there's still 300 people tuned in at home, so I'm, I'm conscious that um, they're sat there as well. Um, our final session of uh, the afternoon is it's focusing on weed management. Um, so we've got Seth, Dr. Sarah Cook, research scientist from, from ADAS, is taking the first slot of this um, of this session, uh, looking at preventative measures against weeds. Thank you very much, Sarah. Right, hello. You can all hear me? Good. <laughs> right, weeds. We've been around since biblical times. Even mentioned in the Bible, not like um, great aphids. Seeds falling among thorns and, and which grow up and choke the crops. Um, but in fact, weed science as a discipline is only about 100 years old, so we're quite a young discipline. But We've been doing IPM for years, years and years. Um, the major development in 1701, when Jethro Tull invented the seed drill, he started to put crops into rows, and that then gave us the opportunity to control weeds between the rows with some other form of implement. But the, the big thing in weed control was the introduction of selective herbicides in 1945, and that sort of changed the face of weed control. But IPM has always been part of uh, weed control, cultivations, everything we do is IPM and it can, and changes weeds. But weeds are very clever and they adapt to every situation and they meet every change that we make in farming. So weeds are like criminals. When not engaged in, in their nefarious activities, both may have uh, admirable qualities. And this reflects the importance now of environmental schemes with, within agriculture. So somebody's weed is another person's charming wildflower on a, an environmental margin or in an infield strip. In fact, we're having trouble at the minute in the industry buying weed seeds. If it's pretty, we can buy it. And if it's unattractive, we can't get the seed. So we may be look, coming to farmers to look for unattractive weeds for our experiments. So I'm just going to go through herbicides, just the current status of weed control in the UK. You may remember this graph from 2010, 29. It was just after we lost trifluralin, which was pretty catastrophic for us. And then we had all these factors, um, you know, facing weeds. So we'd got uh, 1107, 2009, so EU regulations which faced pendimethalin. We got resistance for the sulfonyl ureas, the FOPs and the DIMs. And then we got the issues with water. But we've done quite well out of it, actually. So Clotolyron was withdrawn. We used 3,500 grams of active with that. And then, but recently it's come back at a 500 grams of active level. So a lower level, it doesn't control many grass weeds, but okay for annual metagrass, but not for black grass. Pendimethalin in 2017, we were given another seven year lease of life on that incredibly important active. And it, it's used in so many crops to control a wide range of weeds. The buildup of resistance in sulfonyl ureas, fox and dims, has changed the way that we farm, changed the way that we use herbicides in crops, particularly with aspects of, of blackgrass control. And that's put a lot more emphasis on the use of pre-emergence herbicides. Now, flufenacet is probably one of the most important actives that we do have in our armory at the minute, and yet it's subject to some abuse. It came out as a single active, and now you're only allowed to put one product on, but you can use multiple products. So now it's a subject of discussion and whether we get restrictions on the use of Flumus Fenacet, we will see in the future. We've had several new, new old herbicides appear. The Clonifen, Ethafumazate, Metribuzin have come in and been mixed with old. So basically herbicide usage at the minute is like, we take all the herbicide acts we have, we throw them in a bucket and then we pull them out, mix them up and use them as different new products. So nothing changes, the same basis is there with us. 
Now, the most important herbicide we have, glyphosate, really important in an IPM situation. It's a, a, a complete herbicide. We can use it with a lot of IPM te techniques to control weeds. And if we lose glyphosate, that will, will be terrible. It comes up for review in the EU next December. But in the UK, we, we still get to keep it till about 2025. Hopefully, it won't go. Common sense and science say that we should keep it, but the general public don't like it. We've, we've got possibly, probably, a new herbicide coming in quarter one next year, Simmethylin, which will be similar to the Flufenacet. It will be a, a good herbicide. It's in a new HRAC group and it will support the use of flufenacet as a pre-emergence. And then broadleaf weed control is quite, we have a really good selection of herbicides. We have the old phenoxy herbicides and we have the new um, herbicides and haloxifen methyl, bringing that into oilseed rape, the sort of revolutionized weed control in oilseed rape, controlling the two major weeds that we had there, cranes bill and poppies. And because of campus stem flea beetle coming in, the use of herbicides in oilseed rape has moved to um, pre uh, move away from pre-emergence onto post-emergence, and haloxifen methyl has filled that slot nicely. So just to remind you, you might have forgotten what uh, IPM is. It's, it's a systems approach. We've got diverse cropping systems, cultivar choice, emergence, field and soil management, targeted control, monitoring and evaluation. So it's a circle which goes around and prevent, detect and control. But in weeds, we've been doing this, as I said, for a long time. This is a, a, a table which came from a paper that was produced in 2013. So it's not that old, but it's pretty old. The data uh, collection started in the 1960s for this paper. It's a review paper. And most of the data came from the 70s and 80s from conventional farms, looking at the effects of these techniques on the control of blackgrass. We have a good range of levels of control and, and an average here. And you can see that ploughing, we advocate that for blackgrass control, restarting. Lots of arguments, lots of discussions, whether you should min till, what kind of cultivation should you do? But ploughing is a good way of controlling weeds. It buries um, fresh seeds from the surface and buries them below so they can't grow. And it pulls up old seeds from below. This has led to a detailed understanding of blackgrass. As Stephen Moss said in one of his last presentations that he spent his whole life looking at blackgrass and, and it still hadn't got any better. But we know a lot about grass and the basis of IPM is understanding your enemy, understanding that weed, understanding the biology and how to control it. And that's what Sasha has just talked about in the cabbage stem flea beetle, understanding how, how it lives in the environment and what are its weak spots and how to control it. The thing is with IPM, it's not instant. It takes a long time to control and Sarah Bell mentioned this morning she was doing the roguing. Well, roguing is at the end of a long line of cultural techniques to control blackgrass. And roguing will take those last few plants out. So what are the UK farmers doing for um, IPM control? This is IWM Praise. It's an H2020 project about IPM weed management. They did a survey of UK farmers um, and looked at the major weeds and the strategies that are already being employed for weed control. So the main weed issues, of course, black grass, brome, wild oats, Italian ryegrass, mainly the grass weeds because they're more difficult to control and that's one of the ones we have high levels of resistance in, so herbicides are less likely to control them. Cleavers are a weed, which is a main weed issue. You know, it can cause a lot of problems. But one thing about cleavers, we've not seen any resistance in that to herbicides. And we have a good suite of herbicides to control it. We have cranes bill, which probably is going down in importance as we bring in haloxifen methyl into uh, orsi drape. So we're getting the levels down there. Uh, and then charlotte mayweed and poppy 
and we have resistance in those, but they can be controlled with alternative herbicides. So what are farmers doing for weed control? These, this diagram is the large bubbles show you the greatest levels of use. So you can see here, targeted control from herbicides. And it's pre-sowing herbicides, so that's glyphosate and the pre-M herbicides, which are more important than post-emergence herbicides. And when you've got black grass, you find that the post-emergence herbicides don't work so well as the pre-emergence herbicides. But we rely greatly on herbicides. But saying that, you know, we're using rotations, we're using sowing dates and seed rates, we're changing our cultivations, we're looking at stubble management, and, we, and then now more modern technology of bringing in patch spraying to control weeds. And also scouting, which is the sort of fundamental for IPM, is looking for weeds and then targeting them. So lots of methodology that we're using to control weeds. So it's good news. But as you remember from the talks today, when, when other people, you know, the soils, people are talking about using organic, organic amendments and using cultivations. Weeds, getting your weed control in there is really important because whatever you do will change your weed flora. Now, who can remember nine o'clock this morning when Neil spoke about the review of preventative measures for weeds? This is where we looked at, uh, reviewed all the major weed pests and diseases of wheat, barley, rape and potatoes. And we looked at each IPM technique that could be used for their control. And then we scored these on various categories and then split them into priorities for research in KT. And I'll just go through a couple of each of the ones we've identified for weed control. So a priority research area uh, is precision application for annual grass control. We use a lot of herbicides. So if we can put them on in a precision manner and target the weed species, we will reduce the amount of herbicides that we put on. When you look at um, herbicide usage in crops, about 98% of cereal crops will receive a herbicide. About 98% of all seed rape crops will receive a herbicide. And herbicide use has not fallen. It's increasing over time. So what can we do with precision application? So we start off by mapping things. We've got the ability now to have visual recognition. And, and we started off by looking for large things, so like docks in grassland or black grass heads which sit above the crop. So we could map them and then we could produce, produce the maps, put them into a, a GPS or TK com, uh, sprayer and then spray the patches. The only problem with that is a bit like Russian roulette on the black grass front. If you miss some of the black grass plants, you, you don't necessarily pay for it in yield, but you maintain that black grass population because of the prolific production of seed that they have. So it's a good system mapping it. We can relate them to organic matter and to drainage, and we can relate weeds to patches in fields. So mapping and then treatment in the following year is, is possible. Now, the holy grail really is spotting these weeds and accurately targeting small grass weeds within a growing crop. You know, small grass weeds, they look like the size of a darning needle. They're really tiny compared to uh, wheat and they hide under the crop. If we can spot them and spray them in real time, that would be the thing. And there's quite a lot of work going on with that. I think we can identify them now. We can, we can see the difference between them and wheat. And then we can put a sprayer in there, which will see them and then target them with something like glyphosate or a, a non-selective herbicide or even a selective herbicide. Weed wiping, this is a little bit more um, of a coarse technique, but it is a valuable because we're not spraying on a pesticide. We have a pesticide in solution sitting on a wick on the back of a tractor or an ATV, and we're wiping the, each weed with herbicide. So we're targeting it very uh, closely. This is uh, ideal to use in catchment areas in, in high rainfall grassland uh, around reservoirs. So we can treat um, these weeds individually. 
first, we, we have been using glyphosate, but there is work going on to look at the use of different herbicides on, on, on weed wipers, which target them more specifically. I know people have had a go at targeting blackgrass because blackgrass likes to grow, ooh, not really enough above the crop. You need something like 10 centimetres above the crop to target blackgrass and get all of the heads. But blackgrass only just sneaks above the heads as much as it needs. So blackgrass isn't very good, but we, we can have a go at it. And then the final one is spray application, you know, changing your um, improving drift control, not letting herbicides drift onto margins. And, and so you've got low rates touching brome, which then becomes resistant. Maximizing spray deposition on, of the herbicide onto the weeds, onto the target. And, and these all help to reduce pesticide usage and stop it leaching through the water. Because if pesticides get into water, like propizomide is a major problem, then we are under the cosh of, of maybe losing that herbicide. So the next priority research area is under sowing and companion cropping and also cover cropping as well. I mean, it's quite effective. We can reduce weed densities by up to 55%, but we can affect grain yields. So we can reduce them by 14% or increase them by 22%. So this is some work already done. Perennial weeds are generally unaffected because they can grow through any cover crop. And we've never had a problem in, since the introduction of glyphosate in 1971. Perennial weeds are not really an issue, particularly coops, but they're lurking around the outside of the fields waiting to come in as soon as we stop using glyphosate. I mean, these companion crops, cover crops, they, they have multiple uses. We've, we've heard Sasha talk about um, using them for cabbage stem flea control and also Anne this morning talking about reducing soil compaction. And, and in this sort of area of work, we are running before we've done the research. The research is trying to catch up with farmers on farm using companion crops, using different species. And the worry is that we don't really know too much about some of these species. Are they going to become the next weed species and cause a problem? When should we establish them? What, what time of year? Which species are best? Which ones are more effective? What herbicides do you use? Because sometimes you get weeds in your companion crops or your companion crop gets out of control and, and then starts to overtake your crop. So what herbicides should we use to control them? And then trade-offs. Is disease increased? Is harvest affected? Does it reduce cabbage stem flea beetle? Or do aphids like to live in them? So there's a lot of work that needs to be done that we need to find out more information. So uh, a priority KT area is, is hygiene. Um, and this we've learned from blackgrass. Contaminated straw. So people in the east bailing up black grass infested straw, sending it to the west. And the Irish are always going on about this. It's their fault for buying it. They use it for mushrooms and then they put it on their fields and then they get black grass. And that's all our fault, apparently. So contaminated straw is moved black grass west and north. And we know it has. Forage feed and livestock. 88% of wild oats that a cow eats can survive through the rumen and can go into manure and then is put onto fields. And we know that blackgrass is spread around fields on manure. We know that some can survive through AD. We, we know these things. So what we know, we need to make sure that everybody knows that weed seeds could move through these methods and prevention. So this is all about prevention. Sown seed, we've seen on Twitter, pictures of wild, wild flower seed infested with black grass. So you're planting wild flowers and yet you're planting black grass as well. Transfer on machinery, pea viners, balers. These are a sort of major spreader of black grass and, and we know this. Burning off patches to prevent seed return. And I don't mean with a match, I mean with glyphosate. So often at cereals, you can see people's uh, bare fields with large patches taken out where you're getting black grass. But it, it may look quite dramatic, but you are reducing seed return and, and you can start off with a, a, a bare field with less of black grass in it. And then harvest weed seed control. So uh, some kind of seed remover or seed crusher on the back of a, a combine, widely used in Australia but some of their weeds are more uh, adapted to this kind. They, they retain their seeds to harvest. 
things like black grass, they do lose a lot of their seed before harvest, and also um, brome as well. But it does reduce the amount of seed that goes back, so there's chaff tramlining or, or crushing, and um, there is work going on this, and we know it's a very effective method of reducing weeds. Another area is primary cultivations and drilling date. Pretty simple, pretty simple. And this can be really effective in reducing weed populations. We have a lot of information. Some of it's really, really old, but then we've been cultivating since, since 1701 and, and drilling and drilling wheat then. So we've got ploughing, inversion, burying seeds. Um, brings up old seeds to the surface, but most of the seed gets buried. I mean, there's good ploughing, there's bad ploughing. We can talk about that. Um, deep till, this is basically boiling up the soil, mixing the seed in, in, a, in a deep, you know, depending on how, you know, how deep you go. So up to 20 centimetres deep, allowing some seed to germinate from depth where things like propizomide are unable to kill it because they're forming a layer on the, the surface of the soil. Shallow till, Keeping seed on the surface so we know where it is. We're not bringing up old problems. We're, we're keeping the problem on the surface. Uh, and if we don't have any weeds in the current crop, why bring up problems by doing deep cultivation? And then no-till, direct drilling, very popular at the minute, relies a lot on glyphosate. Uh, but some weeds do adapt to it, like brome. Uh, many layer, uh, few seeds change layers. So what do we think of these methods? You know, ploughing is good, deep tillage is bad. We've got lots of information on this and it's available there and we just need to get it out so we can talk about it and pass on the information that we have. So weed control has always had a high level of IPM. Everything we do, IPM cultivations, and it's back to basics really, it's understanding weeds understanding the biology of that weed when does it emerge how deep does it emerge from you know when does it flower when does it emerge there's plenty of information available in some, sub, some subject areas some of the old stuff is really hidden and, and one good thing at the minute is the bcpc have started to scan in the old brighton conferences and it's available on their website so all that fabulous information is now going to be searchable and available and that was a highlight of the weed review that we did, that there's a lot of information out there, but a lot of it's old and hidden. So new research could change the way we approach weed control in the future. And it's up to us to, to get this research started and, and then use the information that we have on the old information that we have and get it out there so farmers can use. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sarah. That segues nicely into to John, our next speaker I'm going to invite to the stage. Uh, John is Agron Agronomy Knowledge Transfer Development Manager and, um, importantly for this paper, Weed Biology spe Specialist at NIAB. And John's going to talk us through um, herbicide resistance in Italian ryegrass. Thank you, John. Um, thank you for the invitation, first off, um, to come and talk about a little bit of the work that NIAB's been doing uh, on Italian ryegrass. I wanted to talk not just about the work that we've done surveying and, assess and assessing the level of herbicide resistance, but crucially, I think, about talking about integrated weed management for Italian ryegrass and how we're going to have to uh, adopt some of these IWM approaches to manage this uh, emerging weed. Um, so I, I hopefully I don't need to tell you what Italian ryegrass looks like. It looks like Italian ryegrass. The thing I would say is it's always there in the surveys that were carried out. We, particularly have a great systematic surveys periodically, but Italian ryegrass is always there. This is just an example uh, from Bayer, well, Monsanto initially, but Bayer's uh, National Grass Weed Survey. It's increasing every time you do a survey. Um, it's historically, or perhaps in the past, tended to be associated with real hotspots within the UK around North Essex and perhaps around up in uh, Yorkshire area. Uh, but more and more we're seeing it as a more common uh, problematic arable weed on farm. So uh, I'm going to talk, start talking about some 
resistance surveys that we've been ca carrying out. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to give you the buyer beware about all resistance surveys. Uh, I did a Twitter survey the other day. Uh, it turned out 95% of the respondents really enjoyed filling out Twitter surveys online. And that's the problem with the sort of weed surveys where you ask for a sample and we're going to test the resulting sample because if there are no weeds in the field at the end of the season, because you've had a relatively high level of control in crop, there's very few seeds to collect. We are inevitably going to slightly overemphasize the problem. But I don't think that that's a fantastic problem as we're monitoring an emerging and developing situation. It becomes a problem later on because people are making decisions about in-crop herbicides that may not be based on the actual situation on farm. But the main point I wanted to make before we talk about some of this numbers around herbicide resistance in Italian ryegrass is that the herbicide resistance that we're seeing is not the problem, it is a symptom of the problem. So if you cast your mind back to the IWM praise description of all these tactics, we can think about uh, integrated weed management as a whole series of knobs and dials where you've got uh, in-crop herbicides, cultivations, cropping choices in a rotation, cultivation, pre-drilling, uh, non-selective herbicides. If you have the in-crop herbicide dial turned up to number 10 and all the other dials turned down, you will almost inevitably, you're over-reliant on in-crop selective herbicides. We're going to drive, this, drive the development of herbicide resistance. And that's what we need to fix. As I say, these emerging herbicide resistance problems are very much a symptom of that uh, rather than the cause of the problem in the first place. So first of all, I'm going to talk about a uh, resistance survey that we carried about out in 2019. We were supported in doing that by Syngenta, Bayer and BSF. So just about everyone who, who is developing a herbicide for Italian ryegrass management has a significant herbicide on the market. But also I want to really thank AICC members who are enormously supportive in, in doing this initial survey. So we actually, it's not a random survey in this sense, we really targeted populations of Italian ryegrass where we knew that there was an issue on farm reported by the agronomists. Uh, the majority of samples were actually multiple samples collected from the same farm and we'll come back to that in a minute and explain why we've done that. So I'm going to talk about our herbicide resistance test results from these 50 uh, Italian ryegrass samples. But before I do that, I'm just going to flag up some work that we're doing in the current season from Italian ryegrass seed samples that were actually posted to us uh, as a result of a request that we put out uh, through the summer. We asked for samples. Uh, my word, did we get samples? So we had over 200 Italian ryegrass samples sent to us for testing. They're all in the glasshouse right now. Um, that's about four times as many samples as I'd A budgeted for and B had space for. So it's been uh, quite a task to get through them. But what's really interesting is we are, so 90% of these, of people who sent a, a sample and just sent the one. So these really interesting geographic clusters that we're beginning to pick up, this Yorkshire, further north, this area around Kent and North Essex, where we knew that there was a significant issue, but some areas where perhaps we hadn't expected to get quite so many samples. These do appear to be genuine geographic clusters of Italian ryegrass uh, as an emerging problem on farm. Um, in terms of the feedback from the people who sent a sample, so the people who sent a sample all filled out a questionnaire to give us a little bit of context about herbicides and agronomy uh, and status on farm. You know, almost all of the people who sent us a sample are seeing a an increase of the weed on farm. Uh, an awful lot of them are experiencing that weed as a very significant weed in terms of their, their the level on farm and the distribution on farm. So clearly a developing problem. We do seem to be having these hot spots, which may reflect something around the need for biosecurity around Italian ryegrass, maybe spreading uh, locally. Uh, but certainly an increasing problem and definitely something that we feel is worth uh, focusing on a little bit more in the future. So this, we have the 2011 samples in the glasshouse right now. We don't have the test results yet. So I'm going to report on the, the work that we, the initial work that we did a couple of years ago. So in 2019, we tested these 50-odd uh, samples. These are the, uh, the percentage reductions 
uh, in fresh weight that we saw in the pot tests that we do to assay herbicide resistance. You've got very high levels of control at the top. But what you can see is just an enormous level of variability between these individual populations in terms of the effectiveness of herbicide. This really looks like blackgrass style end game herbicide resistance, where you've just got very widespread resistance, very profound levels of resistance. But the main thing which I think is a concern with Italian ryegrass and the reason why we were so well supported in, in this initiative in the first place is that in Italian ryegrass, we are beginning to see the onset of resistance to pre-emergence herbicide actives, which is not something that's been a feature of blackgrass herbicide resistance in the past. It's a particular feature of Italian ryegrass, and it is a real concern. So we are, and I should say that these uh, pre-emergence herbicide tests that we're doing, we're very much at the stage of working on methodologies to make sure that we are going to report herbicide resistant status in preems consistently and make sure that we've got a good testing regime. Um, so this flufenicet resistance is the real issue. We think that Italian ryegrass seems to be a very high risk weed species for the selection of and development of herbicide resistance in the populations. And just to highlight that or, or, or to emphasize that again, we can compare, so these are the 50 Italian ryegrass samples from 2019, all the ALS herbicide resistance results. And you can see this enormous distribution. There are a few samples left where you've got true sensitivity. If we compare that to a sample that we did in 2020 of wild oats, 100 populations of wild oats, you can see in wild oats, we have something that looks a lot more benign. We have a, a collection of uh, sensitivities around a mean at the top, and then we have some outliers. And these outliers represent herbicide resistance individuals. So despite the fact that both wild oats and Italian ryegrass have been in arable fields, since we've st started deploy these family of herbicides, we can see that the biology of the two weeds, the difference in the biology and the genetics of these two weeds leads to one being a much higher risk for the development of herbicide resistance than the other. So wild oats are hexaploid, they're also in crossing, so the rate at which herbicide resistance can be selected for and spread is much lower. So far, all of the lowly multiflorum arable weeds are diploid, so I know that there are commercial cultivars that aren't, but all of the wheat, arable weed populations have been diploids, so relatively simple genetics for um, selection and development of herbicide resistance. And they're also outcrossing, so the spread of the trait is accelerated. So a high-risk weed and a high-risk pattern of use of herbicides. The issue around flufenicet resistance and I'll make a clear distinction here between what we're seeing in Italian ryegrass and what we're seeing in blackgrass. In Italian ryegrass, there are UK sourced populations of Italian ryegrass in which we need nearly a, a kilo of active to get 90% control and more than the field rate to achieve 50% control. So we're talking about absolute resistance in populations in the UK that have been characterized. This is what it looks like. So we use about 180 grams of flufenicet. Field rate is 240 grams, obviously, because preems just work so much better in these uh, container-based studies on a susceptible standard versus one of these very resistant uh, populations uh, that we call Essex. Um, it's not a slight on the whole county. It's where it came from. Um, and if you compare that to the same study with the most extreme population of black grass that certainly we've tested in, in this um, small project where you have a susceptible standard uh, and you have the, the most resistant population. So what we're seeing in Italian ryegrass is absolute resistance. Populations where the food rate of flufenicet no longer gives control. In black grass, we're seeing much more of a picture of shifts in sensitivity but still some utility, still useful control from the field rate of flufenicet. And that differentiation is really important to make. Some work that Bayer Crop Science has done, which has characterized this trait, uh, and it's published the trait in the paper. They've worked both on blackgrass and also on Italian ryegrass. They have shown that in blackgrass, 
there does seem to be cross resistance between these R populations, which are German source populations, but they are showing reduced sensitivity to food phenocet. They are also seeing across the board reductions in control from other pre emergence herbicides. We don't yet know what the picture is in Italian ryegrass, and that's something that we're going to do with this larger survey that we're carrying out this year. We think from our initial work that in the case of Italian ryegrass, the prosulfur carb at least is continuing to give relatively good control. We also think, think that some of the newer actives which are becoming available or are available are not impacted by this herbicide resistance trait. But it is something that we really uh, urgently, I think, need to get to the bottom of because uh, we have been using flufenacet based preems as the mainstay of control of this for a very long time. So we can break it down in terms of the numbers. Uh, so of these 50 samples from this 2019 testing, uh, we have 76% showing uh, double R or triple R, so significant reductions in control from Atlantis type herbicides and indeed all ALS. Uh, Two thirds showing significant reductions when we tested them against Axial. But as I say, most significantly of those 50 samples, 14% of them showed a significantly reduced uh, control from flufenacet in the POP test. So a real a, a step up in the order of difficulty of managing these uh, multiple resistant um, herbicide populations. When we look at the patterns of cross resistance, it's really important when people think about decision making for in-crop herbicides that they fully understand the herbicide resistance status of their individual population on farm, rather than making assumptions uh, from what they might read in the press or, or see on social media, because there are populations in there which are only resistant to Pinoxidan, there are populations which are only resistant to Atlantis, and there are populations that are only resistant to Flufenacet. So unless you do specific testing, targeted testing for this species, you may not be making the right decisions in terms of uh, herbicide option choices, you may be dismissing some choices uh, which are still got utility in the field. One of the features of Italian ryegrass, and this data dates back to a really fantastic PhD thesis by uh, Rocchio Alacon Reverte. Uh, if you just Google understanding and combating the threat posed by Lelia Multiflorum, you will get the whole thesis online. And she looked at the pattern of cross resistance within ACCA's herbicides. So in Italian ryegrass, there seems to be a much more complicated pattern of cross resistance between your FOP, DIM, and DEN herbicides. So there are FOP only resistant uh, Italian ryegrass populations that are still controlled by something like Panoxidem and a DIM herbicide in the break crop perhaps, uh, but not the other way around. So it isn't the case that you can do a test for one of the ACCA's herbicides and rule out the use of all ACCA herbicides, it really does need to be testing, which uh, gets to the bottom of, of this uh, the status of the individual population on farm. So I should say this uh, Rojio's thesis dates back to samples collected in 2006, 2007. At that point, the comparable numbers were 18% of the populations resistant to ALS and 22% uh, showing significant resistance to phenoxidin. So the rate of change in terms of the level of herbicide resistance that we're seeing on farm is, looks to be very rapid and it does reflect uh, a changing uh, scenario and feedback that we're getting from growers. So I talked right at the beginning about these 2019 samples, about the majority of them coming from uh, multiple fields within the same farm. And this is again part of the messaging around if we're going to carry out herbicide resistance testing on farm, uh, it really needs to be carefully thought about and we need to think about the methods. And what I've done here is I've just shown uh, of all the situations where we tested two fields, I've plotted what was the uh, performance of axial in field, field B versus field A versus field B on the same farm and the same for Atlantis. And the point I would make is that the herbicide resistance status of a population from a field on a farm is not actually a fantastic predictor of the herbicide resistance status 
of the same herbicide in a different field on the same farm. Herbicide resistance is being selected for on a really small spatial scale. So if you're going to have systematic herbicide resistance testing as one of your monitor um, vigilance planks of your IWM strategy, it needs to be done on that sort of scale. It needs to be done on an individual field basis uh, and needs to be uh, much more carefully thought out. So a point I really want to hammer home if I get the opportunity is to make the point about what Italian ryegrass is not. It is not perennial ryegrass. So if you're using perennial ryegrass in your mixes, or environmental schemes, we are not talking about carryover of perennial ryegrass into an aerial rotation. It is not the same as commercial Italian ryegrass cultivars. So first of all, the feedback from the survey, uh, the presence of Italian ryegrass as an arable weed is not related to the use of Italian ryegrass in livestock or, her or herbage um, situations. Um, and also some more detailed resistance testing that we've been doing uh, using a dose response approach. When we compare, these are all diploid Italian ryegrass commercial varieties. This is just a selection of these Italian ryegrass weeds. The level of differentiation and, and selection for resistance or, or lack of sensitivity in these arable weeds is completely different to what we're seeing in cultivars. So don't think that you do not need biosecurity or monitoring to look for this weed on farm if you do not have Italian ryegrass as in a livestock enterprise. The arable weed form of this species is spreading entirely independently and looks to be something completely different. And I think that complacency is something that we've got to really, really guard against. So, as I say, the resistance status is much more of a symptom, I think, than a cause of the problem uh, in terms of uh, managing this weed on farm. And I want to talk about some work that's been done in a, uh, one of the areas of this IWM praise project where we're looking at just basic culture control approaches, trying effectively to quantify or, or understand the impact of different culture control approaches for this weed compared to something like black grass where we perhaps have more experience. So we can see a very similar picture in Italian ryegrass culture control approaches that we see in black grass. So here we have plowed plots versus deep non-inversion versus true no-till direct drilled, uh, each of which has got a uh, delayed drilling date in the autumn compared to a spring wheat crop. So delayed drilling in the autumn increases the period between harvest of the crop and drilling the next crop, gives us opportunities outside of the crop for weed control. It moves the establishment of the crop outside of the maximum window of germination for the weed. In addition, later drilling in the autumn tends to give us higher herbicide efficacy because pre-emergence herbicides are tending to work better uh, in the sort of conditions we get around uh, later drilling. So the pattern approaches that we use for black grass management seem to be uh, reflected and very similar in Italian ryegrass. The size of the effects does not seem to be as large. So whereas we may be able to manage Italian ryegrass out of arable rotations with these approaches, we're going to have to work harder to manage, uh, I mean, we're going to manage black grass out. We're going to have to work harder with Italian ryegrass. So one feature of the biology of Italian ryegrass which undermines spring cropping as a rotational tool is that although, so these are again some data from the latest IWM praise trial where we had uh, drilling dates, two drilling dates in the autumn and then through drilling dates in the spring. You can see the decline that we observe in Italian ryegrass seedling number in the autumn and then going through into the spring. A similar pattern in terms of reducing the establishment of weeds with drilling date. But crucially with Italian ryegrass, one of the features of the biology is that spring emerging Italian ryegrass individuals are capable of producing a great deal of seed. Whereas with black grass, that simply isn't the case. So I'll point to some older data where we actually did individual, looked at individual ringed plants of black grass. Uh, Italian ryegrass, and in this case, fat hen, which is an obligate spring germinator just to put some context. 
These are individuals which emerge in the autumn in a winter wheat crop. And then in the same winter wheat crop, these are individuals which emerge in the spring. So spring emerging individuals into an established crop, whilst they are possible, they are not a significant contributor to seed return. But here are the spring sown individuals in a spring crop in this trial. And you can see that whilst the seed return from the black grass, the plant biomass at maturity from the black grass is still low, because this is a weed with, which is not particularly fit when it emerges in the spring, the Italian ryegrass is perfectly capable of producing large, significant plants. And this ability to, uh, this fitness in the spring emergence and this ability to reproduce uh, when emerging in the spring is, is, undermines the effectiveness of spring cropping as a rotational tool for Italian ryegrass. It's one of the key differentiators between this weed uh, and black grass weed that we're more used to. The other differentiator is that here we have a weed where the emergence and germination profiles are much more staggered through the autumn. So these are, again, some data from Rocchio's thesis, uh, just to show that uh, although most of the weed does emerge with the drilling of the crop, there is a significant tail with later germinating individuals coming after the drilling. And that's a challenge for targeting herbicides and it means we need to be aware of all of these individuals germinating. So, in summary, we have a, an emerging and developing problem. Multiple herbicide resistance Italian ryegrass is much harder to manage in practice than uh, multiple herbicide resistant blackgrass. I really want to talk about that before it becomes a more widespread issue. It's the level of intensity and an intensity of flifenacet resistance, that's a specific issue of, of concern at the moment. We really encourage people to monitor, record, be vigilant. If you, aren't, if you do not have this weed on farm and you begin to see individual plants, it is at this point that an intervention will save you a fortune in the long run. Autumn drilling date for controlling this weed seems to have a similar dynamic to uh, black grass management, but the effectiveness of spring cropping is very much diminished by the ability of these spring emerging individuals to produce so much seed. Plowing remains an option. I know it may not be everyone's cup of tea. Uh, we need to be aware of this prolonged germination and that could be a challenge in practice. And also, uh, and I think Sarah alluded to this, as we um, evaluate new tools around harvest weed seed control uh, and around um, precision interro mechanical weeding, for an example, we need to be open to those opportunities to reduce our reliance on in-crop selective herbicides. So I hope that's uh, put the fear of God into you about a new weed, because I think it should. I think not everyone has this problem. We really need to be aware of the size of the problem if it becomes established on farm. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, and that leads us into our last technical speaker of the day, Jed Clark, another PhD student at HDB sponsored. We're very proud to have you also up on, on the stage here today. Jed's going to be talking about weak germplasm for enhanced competition against black grass. Thank you very much, Jed. Thank you. Yeah, I'm a second year PhD student at Leeds and I'm going to talk today about my research project, which is identifying weak germplasm for enhanced competition against black grass. So why is black grass such a pain in the field? So most of you will probably know the impact that black grass has on our crops, but why is it so successful? So firstly, black grass is a weed. It likes to grow on arable land. This land is highly nutritious, full of nitrogen. Um, and as a grass weed, black grass is going to love it. Um, secondly, the lack of uptake in non-chemical integrated weed management programs. Um, we've seen promising results from things such as ploughing and delayed drilling and rotational crops, but there needs to be a greater uptake in these methods, um, especially if we are to reduce the reliance on chemical herbicides. Um, Thirdly, has our selection and breeding of wheat led to susceptible crops? So over the last 40 years or so, wheat has been bred for a greater harvest index. And during the same time, 
black grass has emerged as sort of the most important herbicide resistant weed species in the UK. And um, so are these things linked? Have we sort of unwittingly made weeds susceptible to the environment and susceptible to being outcompeted by weed species such as black grass? So what are we doing to fight back? So integrated weed management, um, we're coming up with new methods, new approaches. Um, part of this is to explore cultural control and certain wheat varieties have been described as being more competitive against black grass than others. So can we use these competitive cultivars um, as a way of suppressing black grass in the, in the field? So this is my project. This is an overview of all the aims um, that we wish to achieve during my project. Um, I won't go through this slide now, but I'm going to go through each of these objectives one by one in this presentation. So firstly, understanding how and when black grass actually outcompetes wheat. So we have two key observations to help us to answer this question. So firstly, black grass is less competitive against barley than it is against wheat. And secondly, black grass is less competitive against uh, wheat under spring conditions. So what is it about winter conditions and what is it about wheat that makes black grass successful? So firstly, time, does time affect how competitive black grass is? So here we have an experiment where we've, in winter conditions, we've grown wheat in and out of black grass competition. You can see that on the image on the right. Um, and what we did was record tiller number in wheat over time. So if you look at the graph on the left, you can see that in the first three to four months of growth, there was hardly any effect of black grass on wheat tiller number. Um, only after around four months did we start to see that wheat in competition with black grass actually started to reduce into the number uh, compared to uh, wheat without this black grass competition. So this is indicating that firstly black grass takes a long time to actually have a competitive effect on wheat um, and this may be a reason why you don't see black grass um, being successful in spring plantings. And even though we did see an effect of black grass this sort of effect was very small. So how is black grass actually outcompeting wheat? Um, so on the left here, we have two images. Firstly, we have black grass and on the right, we have wheat. So these have been grown in hydroponics. So grown in water without soil. So this allows us to visualize and measure the roots more easily. Um, and as you can see from the images, black grass has a much more developed root system than wheat. So these plants are the same age. Um, and what was more interesting was if you look at the investment of each species into the roots and into the shoots, if you look at wheat, um, the root to shoot ratio was 1 to 3.2. So wheat is much more interested in putting energy into producing above ground growth. Whereas in black grass, this ratio was more even, so 1 to 1.2. So black grass is sort of much more investing into below ground growth. So this difference in root growth could be a reason why black grass may be able to outcompete wheat. And thirdly, winter growth rate. So this graph here shows um, wheat and black grass growth in hydroponics uh, in both winter and spring conditions. And this is the final biomass of those plants. So if you look at the topmost arrow, you can see that under spring conditions, um, wheat had a higher growth rate um, and could produce larger plants than black grass. However, if you look at the bottommost arrow, the same comparison, but under winter conditions, um, black grass actually had a higher growth rate and was able to produce bigger plants. So then again, this is the reason why black grass may be able to outcompete wheat during the winter period. So all these things sort of put together have allow allowed us to come up with our root growth hypothesis. So this sort of states that black grass will gain a competitive advantage over wheat due to firstly, faster growth in winter conditions, secondly, increased investment in the root system, and thirdly, prolonged period uh, during the winter to build a root system. And all of these together would allow black grass to dominate underground uh, space and resources by the springtime. 
Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that black grass doesn't have these same advantages during spring, uh, spring plantings. So in order to test our root growth hypothesis, we have brought sort of barley into the equation. So barley is a species that is uh, more competitive against black grass than wheat is. So can we compare uh, barley and wheat root growth uh, and see if we can spot any uh, traits or signs that may convey a competitive advantage or disadvantage either way. Um, so to do this, we're using this riser box setup. So on the right, we have an image of barley and black grass roots in this riser box. And you can clearly see that the root traits of both of these plants are different. Um, and what we want to do is see, can we use different inter and intra sort of specific setups of this uh, riser box to get a full idea of how um, these plants are producing roots and how they are reacting to different neighbors. So this is um, data that we have for barley and wheat grown in those riser boxes, but without competition, so by themselves. And as we can see from around day 32 on this graph, that barley is actually producing a greater amount of roots than wheat. So is one reason why barley is more competitive than wheat is maybe because it's producing more roots. So we want to move from lab trials to container trials to eventually into field trials. So this is something we've recently set up in collaboration with ADAS down in Boxworth. Um, here we are testing seven, seven different cereal varieties um, with different genetic histories. So we're looking at land races and elite varieties, which would theoretically have different root traits. Um, and we want to test how well these uh, different varieties do um, in the presence and absence of black grass and those in presence of black grass, how, black grass, how well do they actually suppress the weed? So this will be very, really interesting to see what we get from this. So the fourth thing we wanted to test in my project was the role of chemical signaling in competition. Um, so in order to test this, we have been growing wheat and black grass in this barrier setup. So we have a look at the image on the left where it says in competition. Um, we have wheat and black grass in the same part in the presence of a permeable root barrier. So this root barrier will allow uh, chemicals and water to pass through, but will prevent physical roots from interacting. Um, and we also had some controls where we grew black grass and wheat by themselves in the same setup. And what we saw was when the two plants are able to compete uh, through chemical uh, signaling. So these are the bars BCW on this graph. Um, the growth of both plants was actually smaller than when both plants were grown by themselves where chemical signaling wasn't available between the plants. And in the case of wheat, this was actually significantly different. Um, so this is sort of given as uh, evidence that there's mutual chemical inhibition occurring between wheat and black grass. And we're going to further this by looking at the inter and intraspecific relationships between wheat, between wheat plants, between black grass plants, and between wheat and black grass. Um, to get an idea of how chemical signaling as a whole is affecting the ability of wheat to compete with black grass. So what we aim to achieve is to provide you guys with new angles for integrated weed management, weed management. Um, we want to identify traits and lines in wheat that are more competitive uh, to give you another factor to consider when choosing which varieties to plant. We want to be able to influence the direction of crop breeding. Um, so if roots are a key uh, point for competition, an emphasis on root traits will actually be beneficial. Um, and overall, we just want to help to reduce the impact of black grass um, on our crops. Thank you. My thank you slide seems to have disappeared. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Have a seat, Sarah and John. Right, what have we got? Is there any research into rotation length and grass weed burdens? It would be interesting to know what the minimum length is at part of 
as part of IFM. Anybody going to be brave enough? <laughs> As a ballpark figure, um, grass weed seeds which are buried in uh, persistent seed bank are going to lose their viability about 70 to 80 percent a year. So, their high abundance in arable rotations does rely on there being input. Um, how long you need before you get down to uh, lower levels sort of depends on where you start, doesn't it? That's been the experience. So, 70 percent or 20 to 30 percent survival of a terribly high number is still quite a high number. So it, it does really depend on um, the seed bank size as to how long your rotation needs to be. John, I've got a few Italian ryegrass questions coming here, so I'm quick fire them at you. How long does Italian ryegrass remain viable in the soil, see, uh, of blackgrass? Limited data, but it's about the same as blackgrass in terms of its persistence. The best way to control weeds is to stop them being there in the first place. How do we stop Italian ryegrass getting into the farms and fields to begin with? Uh, well, I mean, Sarah talked about it. Biosecurity around machinery, um, contamination in both crop seeds and non-crop seeds. Um, but I think, realistically, it's about, you know, the story of Italian ryegrass is usually, oh, I saw a few plants in the, you know, where the baler had been, and then there was a patch, and now it's a terrible problem. If you intervene at that early stage where you just see a few plants, that's the real message, I think. Sarah, if, if weed resistance is largely confined to a field, how do you stop resistance increasing in other fields on the farm? Is it mostly machinery hygiene, in your opinion? Well, that, that's sort of one aspect, is hygiene and preventing blackgrass or ryegrass moving from field to field. But if you have a blackgrass population present in a field, your herbicide use will start selecting out resistant individuals. So there's sort of two ways, two way spread, really. Thank you. John, would the use of Italian ryegrass in environmental options increase the risk of this weed becoming more of a problem? Uh, I don't think Italian ryegrass being used in, in environment, I think perennial ryegrass is being used in environmental options and that isn't an issue. So that's one of the key things of trying to, you know, Italian ryegrass is not the same as perennial ryegrass. The risk around perennial ryegrass is around contamination of the perennial ryegrass seed with Italian ryegrass individuals. And that is about making sure you're getting your non-crop seed for a really uh, top-notch supplier. Thank you. Linking questions, keep on moving around. Is, John, is there likely to be a bigger grass weed issue in the future if the grass is reintroduced to help carbon sequestration objectives in arable rotations and to break up the existing rotational weed management issues? Um, I mean, I think that there are all sorts of risks about changing the weed flora as a result of, let's say, uptake of conservation agriculture or regenerative agriculture. They're not in particular around grass weeds. They're more around um, weeds which are invasive of no-till systems like vulpia and birchervil. So I, I think the adoption of, of more diverse rotations, uh, you know, and everything that's in cover crops and so on, that's everything that's involved in regenerative and uh, conservation agriculture is a good thing for grass weed management. I think our issues are around some specific species which are uh, a risk either you know failure of biosecurity in the non-crop seed specific weeds which are invasive of that system so i wouldn't put it that way i think if you make a system change you change the weeds which are the problem i think as well in the system with the grass weeds you want to make sure your weed grasses don't set seed so grazing or possibly animals don't like black grass and they will leave it, it will set seed. So you're not solving the problem, you're still producing seed and letting it go back into the system. So mowing it and making sure it doesn't seed is sort of key to having it that's in the grass system. Okay, okay, one to Jed and then one to Sarah and then we'll close. Um, Jed, your project sounds very interesting. What are the next steps for your work? So we want to be able to screen through lots of different weed lines. Um, so if root growth 
is the key factor for competition. We want to be able to screen different wheat lines for root growth and identify those that have the highest. Um, and then can we test these under field conditions to see if there is actually a transferable effect? Brilliant. Thank you, Jed. Uh, Sarah, thank you for your talk. In terms of maximising deposition, reducing drift and minimising herbicide usage, is ADAS currently running any research regarding the use of nanoparticles and nanoherbicides against target weeds or pests? Not that I know of. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. I'll, I'll close it off there on that note. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to hand over. We opened the, the conference with um, Sarah Bell, who's one of our board members. And we're going to close the conference with Stephen Briggs, who's also one of our board members. Stephen's got many accolades. He's a consultant, farmer, um, Nuffield scholar, all sorts. I could go on for, for a long time. But Stephen, I'm going to hand over to you to close off today. Thank you very much, Richard. I'll be, I'll be really brief. It's been a long day. Uh, it's been a, a, a very packed and uh, incredibly impressive day, full of information. And I should say, well done for the, the AHP, AHDB team for putting together you know, a really good event. And I, I, I applaud you to thank, thank them all for doing that. Um, and also, thank you for those that are still here. Uh, you know, that shows resilience in itself. Um, there's no doubt we're in a massively changing landscape, um, really, from a, a farming uh, and, and a business point of view and a political uh, point of view as well. Um, and and a, a changing landscape in terms of what levy payers and farmers are going to need. And that's going to require uh, a change or, or evolving and adapting agronomy services, uh, using some of the tools we, we, we've heard about today to help with the adoption of IPM, uh, to meet to that increased appetite from farmers for, for those approaches to improve ways uh, to monitor soil health and, and assess varieties and choice, to using long-term re research data in different ways, uh, to looking at new systems-based approaches of, of assessing our farming systems, and, and creating collaborations between different research organizations and delivery models. But what is clear <clears throat> is that the research that we've seen today <clears throat> Uh, both from AHDB staff and, the, I should say, the really high-quality PhD staff is of really high value and of great relevance, and I, I think that's to be applauded. Uh, and, and to meet the challenges and the changing climates, markets, economies and um, policies that we're, we're seeing, um, uh, to, to really build resilience on farm, the agronomy skills and knowledge is actually going to be really you know, front and centre. It's going to be really important to get that right. And AHDB, as it moves forward, we need to ensure that the evidence that's, that's generated supports that, 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 that um, advice on farm and um, uh, answers the questions posed by farmers in, in, a, in a good value for money way. So I would say from the agronomy sector, you know, uh, there, there's a lot of information being provided from days like today and throughout the, out throughout the year. Value that. Uh, uh, share with the farmers you work with that, that it is being funded through their, their levy system. And, and please um, aim to try and uh, get the, the farmers you work with to engage in this sh shaping the future consultation. You've all got one of these, I think, on your, on your, uh, uh, on your chairs. <clears throat> Um, some farmers will, will engage with this straight away. Others will, will be a bit more maybe reticent or reluctant to engage with it. It is their, it is their levy that's being used to fund this work. So please assist them uh, as agronomists or, or industry representatives to, to engage in this process and help, help shape the future that's fit for purpose and, and a future that we want to see as farmers and, and, and land managers. And I, and I wish you all a really safe journey home. I'll hand back to Richard to uh, to just uh, just close the day. Thank you. Richard. All that leads us to do is thank all of our speakers today for some fantastic content. Like Steve said, I won't revisit what he said, but fantastic all day. And our PhD PhD students, wow, you've all done top job. Congratulations. Um, feedback forms are on on the. Um, on your chairs, um, we, we, 
can you hand them in as you go out? Um, and I was going to say, you, you, you can't go until you, until you hand them in, really. <laughs> and you have a basis in the roaster points. If you haven't collected them in the hallway, um, please, please do. Um, as you're heading out, please don't forget to return your name badge to the registration desk as well. And for those of you that have joined us online today, you can complete the feedback form and claim your basis and Neroso points by using the links that are in the reception area um, of Hopin. The recordings of all of the presentations and sessions today will be made available online after the event and the fungicide performance curves will be emailed to everybody tomorrow. So look out for those coming to your inbox. Just need to say a special thank you to Amanda Tomlinson and the rest of the events team who, without their work, we wouldn't have been able to put on uh, this event today. And also my colleague Fiona Geary, who's been really busy behind the scenes managing all of the questions coming in as well. So my final thanks is to Richard for doing a brilliant job of co-chairing with me. Thank and me. thank you to all of you for coming along today and for joining us online. We wish you a safe journey home and a happy Christmas. Thank you. Thank you.